Dr. Kate Chan. Um, she is a fellow pediatric urologist and health services researcher at Indiana University. Um, she did her medical school at St. Louis University, um, her urology fellowship at Case Western Reserve in Cleveland, um, and then her pediatric urology fellowship at Boston Children's. During her fellowship, she um, earned a master's of public um, health from uh, Harvard Public School of Health. So Dr. Chan is really one of the pioneers of health services research in the field of pediatric urology. Um, her research is focused on shared decision-making um, within our field. And she has NIH funding through the NIDDK to develop and pilot test decision support tool for parents of boys with hypospadias, um, which she'll tell us about today. Um, this is a very common condition that we see in a pediatric urology clinic. And so the work that she's doing is awesome. It's very important. So um, Dr. Chan, we are really honored to have you um, here with us today and greatly appreciate um, your taking the time. So we look forward to hearing your talk. Great, thank you so much. It's an honor to be with your group as well. And uh, thanks for the opportunity. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Let's see here. All right, can everybody see that okay? Thumbs up. Okay, awesome. Well, thanks again. So as uh, Courtney mentioned, I'm a pediatric urologist and health services researcher at Indiana University. And I'll be talking with you today about our development of a hypospadias decision aid, which we're calling the hypospadias homepage. And specifically, we'll get into the details of how we've engaged stakeholders in the development process. Let's see here. There we go. Okay, so this project is funded, as she said, by a grant from the NIH, specifically the NIDDK. I'm on a K23 and I'm in year four of that project right now. Okay, so hypospadias decision making is a rather complex process and there's not very much in the literature about this. Um, there has been a little bit about uh, decisional conflict and regret and we'll get into some of that data. And then we'll talk about a decision framework for hypospadias that we've developed with some of our qualitative work. Uh, the next part of the talk, we'll, talk, we'll discuss how to develop a decision aid, and specifically, we'll reference some of the standards for development and some criteria for evaluation of decision aids. And then we'll get into our real-world example, which is the development of our Hypospadias homepage. Feel free to jump in and ask any questions as I'm talking. We can also hopefully have a little bit of time at the end. Okay, so hypospadias, as Courtney mentioned, is a relatively common condition with a prevalence of 1 in 250 uh, male infants. It has a wide range of severity uh, from more mild to severe. Basically, it's defined as an opening for the urethra that's not at the tip of the penis. It can be just slightly displaced, uh, still on the glands, or all the way down at the base of the, of the penis at the scrotum. So um, what you see here on the screen is a couple of examples of some of the visual aids that we've developed uh, for parents and have included in the decision aid. Uh, we have some illustrations for our medical illustration team here on the left. And on the right side of the screen, you can see an icon array, which is uh, one way of uh, describing data visually for the parents. So hypospadias decision making has been uh, part of a controversial area, and I'm sure Dr. Sandberg has some uh, insight into this as well. There's been some recent legislation more so focused on uh, patients with disorders of sexual differentiation, but some of the legislation has been applied somewhat broadly and could potentially include uh, patients with hypospadias. The controversy is really about the age at which these children should be having surgery, and obviously parental decisions come into play with that discussion. Um, there is some uh, previous literature about decision-making in hypospadias, particularly from the group at Sick Kids in Toronto, uh, where they've noted decisional conflict and regret in a significant number of parents who are facing this decision. There was a recent systematic review actually just published um, that showed about 62% of parents had uh, decisional regret. Um, so in our previous work, we noted that there was uh, parental anxiety and uncertainty around this decision because of the lack of credible information online. Okay, so what is decisional conflict? Some of you may be familiar with this, particularly if you do work in shared decision making. It's technically, it's defined as personal uncertainty about which course of action to take. And there's a choice among competing options. And this is related, of course, to healthcare decisions. And this involves looking at risk, regret, and challenges to personal life values. The key question is, how does this affect patient outcomes? And we'll get into that a little bit later. The shared decision making, uh, this is a nice slide because it really summarizes the differences between shared decision making in which you are uh, have more of a two-way street between the provider and the patient and a more traditional or paternalistic approach and the top of the slide in which there's really kind of a one-way street where the provider just gives some information and recommendations to the patient. 
Um, shared decision making on the bottom, as you could see, there's certainly information provision, but there's an, actually an attempt to elicit the patient's values and preferences and determine how that can affect their decision making process. So I'd like to show you a video that we have included in our decision aid because this is a mother describing her experience with hypospadias decision making. And I think if you listen carefully, you can see there are some elements of shared decision making in this process. The process of making the decision for us um, started when we went to the consultation with the urologist um, when our son was about seven months old. We realized that the decision was actually in our hands. Then we asked um, a lot of questions at that appointment um, and just gained a lot of information at that visit and um, then eventually decided not to do the surgery. We did do a little bit of research, just minimal research on our own. Um, I think maybe just Googling the name of the condition, um, but we felt the most reassured and the most informed in that conversation with the doctor where we could ask our questions and, um, and our questions that came after the answers to the questions and things like that. We decided not to do the surgery because it seemed like at this point in time, it would not be necessary. Kind of in the back of our minds, we're thinking if when he's older, we, we definitely find out he needs to have it. We'll, we'll seek it out then, but um, for now, everything is okay. Okay, so now I'd like to transition a bit and talk about decision aids. So these are evidence-based tools that can help facilitate shared decision making. They're not meant to replace the relationship between the patient and provider, as you can see in the video, that's clearly very important to that particular mother. But they are um, certainly particularly useful for preference sensitive conditions in which there's not really a clear right or wrong answer. Let me go back just one second here. There we go. Okay, so decision support uh, comes in various forms. This is simply one format. Uh, the point of it is to provide information uh, such as benefits, risks, probabilities, and uncertainty, but also realign expectations of the outcome and most importantly, to clarify the patient's values. And the key is that decision aids and other types of decision support tools may improve the decision quality. So there's several guiding frameworks for the development of decision aids. Uh, the most important one is probably the International Patient Decision Aid Standards Collaboration. This was an international group of uh, investigators that got together in 2003 and developed in a internationally approved set of decision aid criteria, uh, which is quite extensive. We, we don't have time to get into all of it today, but essentially there's 12 quality dimensions that they looked at. Um, in addition, there's an Ottawa decision framework, and this was actually the original framework for the development of decision aids uh, produced by the Ottawa Hospital Research Institutes. And uh, I consider their website to be kind of, I call it decision aid central, and I have the reference down there. Um, it's a wonderful source of decision aids. They actually have an A to Z inventory of a, a number of available decision aids online, as well as a, um, a tutorial where you can essentially design your own decision aid with their template. So I highly recommend that. Um, this is a little bit more detail about the decision support framework. It's based on theories and concepts from general and social psychology, social support and decision analysis. And it basically states that decisional needs among patients will have an impact on their decision quality over there on the right, which will then impact their behaviors, actions, emotions, and health outcomes. Decision support tools can help clarify their needs, uh, provide counseling, and improve the decision quality among patients by addressing these unresolved decisional needs. Okay, so this is a slide um, taken from a recent paper on the development of a decision aid for um, uh, basically patients who are premenopausal and have breast cancer. Um, I think this is a really helpful figure, which is why I included it. So it takes you kind of from the beginning to the end of a decision aid development process. You see in step one, it talks about prototype development, which is guided by information from a literature review, um, a, need, a series of needs assessment interviews, which is basically qualitative background work. Um, and then in step two, um, you engage the stakeholders uh, to help collaboratively decide on the final content for the decision aid. 
Um, and then in step three, uh, you basically create a paper prototype. And then in this particular case, they created an online version to mirror the paper version. And then finally, in step four, they perform some alpha testing in which they show the decision aid to the stakeholders and they look at concepts such as usability and acceptability and comprehensibility and then make some modifications prior to field testing. So this is essentially mirrors what we did and I'll show you that process kind of from start to finish. We're currently in the alpha testing phase. Okay, so this is an overview of what we've done so far in terms of stakeholder engagement. Uh, we've done a series of qualitative interviews as well as focus groups with various stakeholders. Uh, first, we engaged the parents in a series of qualitative interviews where we explored their decision making priorities and preferences. Um, we've also, and during these focus groups with parents, we've discussed their views on shared decision making. And as well, we've engaged providers in several focus groups to talk about shared decision making in terms of potential barriers, um, viewpoints, um, that type of thing. And then finally, if I go over here, uh, we've invade, engaged all of these stakeholders in the development of decision aid prototypes. So this is our first paper from this, this project uh, in which we developed a theoretical framework of the parental decision making process about hypospadias surgery to help inform the development of the decision aid. We conducted 17 semi structured interviews with English speaking parents of hypospadias patients um, using a grounded theory approach. And we explore their role as proxy decision makers, which I'm sure, as all of you are aware, in pediatrics is really very common. Um, we explore their emotions and concerns, their informational needs, and various influences on their decision. And we continue to interviews until we reach thematic saturation. So we used two, two coders, um, and then we uh, created a consensus about the core concepts in each stage of the decision making process. I'll give you just a brief overview. Um, so the, these are the results in terms of our demographics. Um, like I said, the majority were mothers, um, the majority were also Caucasian, and they were roughly evenly distributed between preoperative and postoperative parents, and we had a wide variety in terms of the medial location as well. And so that, in other words, we had variety in terms of the spectrum of severity. So this is our decision framework. Um, so we basically divided this into four stages. Uh, the first one is processing the diagnosis. And we noted that there was some difficulty with processing, mostly due to knowledge gaps about the condition. In stage two, parents synthesize information from a variety of resources, and they sought information to counter anxiety uh, that they, they felt about the condition. Um, generally speaking, they sought information from the internet, of course, as well as their providers. Um, in stage three, they identified emotions and concerns related to the condition, particularly fear of the unknown, um, thoughts about separation anxiety from the child, and wanting to do the right thing for their child. And then in stage four, they finalized the decision and there were, we created two different pathways here and path one is more of an information seeking path in which there was some anxiety and confusion. Um, and then they kind of ultimately got to a shared decision making process at the end. And then path two is more people who had just complete trust of the provider really weren't interested as much in shared decision making and just relied on the provider's recommendation. So as you can see, this is actually a fairly general framework could be applied to a lot of pediatric urology conditions. So this is our second paper, which we talked about um, knowledge gaps, information seeking behavior, and specific informational needs of parents when they're making decisions. This is based on the same set of interviews. And we identified the four key knowledge gaps for them, um, which would be number one, epidemiology of the condition. Two would be surgical timing and the specifics of the technique. Um, three would be perioperative expectations, uh, particularly like with the recovery and the wound care, things like that. And then finally, long-term outcomes, such as cosmesis and potential complications. Um, and not surprisingly, the primary source for information was the internet. But parents expressed concerns about the clarity and the reliability of information online. And they got information from a variety of resources, including parent blogs and various forums or chat rooms. Um, hospital websites, and I was a little surprised by this, medical journals and databases as well. So they identified several informational needs. Number one was more clear, reliable online information they felt like they could trust. Um, they wanted to see a wider variety of images, and they felt that the images online were generally skewed towards much more severe cases. They were seeking more mild cases and also post-operative results. And then finally, they wanted to see video testimonials from the parents, which was something that was definitely lacking online. So we have here a picture of, this is an example of some of the content we've created for the decision aid, which is a very you know, cartoon-like figure with some carefully labeled um, areas where the pee hole is actually located and showing the wide variety of severity of the disease as well. So this is our next paper where we looked at provider perspectives on shared decision making. And this is again from a series of provider focus groups this included both pediatric urologists as well as general pediatricians. 
um, in which we discussed various aspects, including the, their definition of shared decision making, how they would apply it clinically, and what kind of barriers they could see and trying to use this in clinical practice. Um, so our median age was 47.5 years. The majority were Caucasian and slightly majority were male. We included nurse practitioners as well as MDs in this crew. And um, basically, the providers told us that they use shared decision making to discuss preference sensitive conditions, such as hypospadias, and we tried to guide them about, you know, talking about hypospadias primarily, but the discussion naturally shifted towards other conditions. The pediatricians actually mentioned vaccines as an area where they use shared decision making. Um, they also use it to affirm that no intervention is a reasonable choice, so observing something as instead of intervening. Um, encouraging parental compliance, again, for example, with the vaccines. And then the pediatrician said that they use it to avoid unnecessary referrals to specialists. So they identified a number of barriers to adoption, and these were common between both the pediatricians and pediatric urologists. Um, and I, we really identified these as and classified them as parental factors versus provider or system level factors. On the parent side, they, they perceived a lack of interest, um, perhaps some misconceptions about the medical evidence. Um, some anxiety, and also just coming to the visit having already finalized the decision. Um, as far as the provider and system level factors, not surprisingly, time constraints in the clinic were one, um, pressures to, for productivity, as well as just bias or opinion. So we concluded that pro providers were quite knowledgeable about shared decision making, but in order to address some of the barriers they identified, we would suggest making decision aids adaptable for use prior to the clinical visit, introducing them early in the decision making process, and considering a provider orientation or educational session about shared decision making. So in this next uh, paper, this is uh, one that was actually just published this year. Um, this is a, kind of the start to finish of our development process for the actual prototype. Um, so we talked in this paper, we described how we engage the stakeholders in these what we call co-design workshops. This is kind of terminology from the field of human-centered design, which is slightly different but similar to qualitative research in which you're really engaging the stakeholders in the design of some type of product or service. That's essentially the definition. So we created these um, design workshops and uh, we used qualitative content analysis to analyze the transcripts and worksheets. And then we had a prototyping session in which we had a multidisciplinary team look at all of these, um, all of the data that we collected thus far and identify the key requirements for a decision aid. So in this case, we had uh, 10 parents, 17 providers. Um, and in, in, uh, in terms of the findings, uh, they recommended multimedia interactive decision aid prototypes that would be available 24 seven. So this is just a sample worksheet. This is um, how we started the, the process, which we gave them this worksheet and divided them into small groups. And we asked them to create some type of device to help parents make decisions about surgery for their son. We asked them when and where parents might use it, what format it would have, and what could it do to help parents make the decision. Um, so they wanted it to be, of course, interactive, user-friendly, customizable to their son's specific condition, and then also be appropriate for people with different learning styles. So these are some prototype examples. I think this is a really interesting slide because it, it shows the prototypes from the three different groups. Um, so there's an example of a parent prototype on the left, uh, a pediatric urology prototype in the middle, and then a general pediatric provider prototype on the right side. Um, so as you can see, there is um, you know, a lot of different suggestions, which we basically uh, summarize in this slide. So I'll take you here. This is what's called an affinity diagram, which again is another concept from human-centered design. Um, in which they looked at the different aspects of a decision aid. In this case, environment of use, form, function, and content. So as far as the environment, they primarily saw this as something to use at home or work, but also in other places like the doctor's office or daycare. Um, as far as format, the, primarily they recommended a website or an app. Um, content, uh, they recommended hypospadias information as well as information about the procedure. They wanted to see a variety of visual aids, uh, statistics, frequently asked questions, expert stories and advice, and some pros and cons about the procedure. And then finally, as far as function, they recommended some type of decision-making activity, um, as well as a way to connect people. Ideally, they wanted to see some sort of online forum or chat room so parents could talk to each other or talk to a provider. Um, and then in terms of education, they wanted it to be, um, have educational content for both parents and caregivers. Um, so this is uh, the result of our design and prototyping session with our multidisciplinary team. This included human-centered designers, health services researchers, um, human-computer interaction expert, as well as a web design and development team. 
And this, so we took all of the data that I just mentioned and came up with sort of the key components for decision aid, keeping in mind our budget restrictions. So for example, the parents wanted this online forum, you know, with a Q&A session, and we just decided that really wasn't going to be feasible. So we just, we thought brainstorm ways to do something similar to help them feel more connected. Um, we did decide to do, and this is, you can see under features here, uh, where they said connecting people, we decided to do testimonials actually. Um, to help them feel more connected to the other parents without actually having to police an online forum because we just thought there would be some medical legal issues with that. So again, here we have the users on the left hand side, um, parents, patients and doctors, for example, um, the different environments and timing of use, uh, the format, again, primarily an app or website. These are the various features, as we've mentioned before. And then finally, a, a, a section on hypospadias education. Um, and interestingly here, there, were, uh, there was a lot of overlap in what the various groups recommended. The pediatricians actually were the only ones who recommended looking at long-term outcomes and complications. Interestingly, the surgeons did not recommend looking at that. <laughs> so, um, so this is a site map, which is essentially like an outline of the website that we created based on the prototyping session. Let me go back. There it is. Um, so that you can see the home page at the top, and then you branch out to the different modules. The first one being hypospadias. Uh, this is a lot of the information like the epidemiology that the parents wanted to see um, and the long term outcomes that they wanted as well. Uh, surgery basics is its own module, the goals and the basic steps. And then uh, testimonials is its own module. Initially, we, we wanted to include parents and adolescents, but we found that getting the adolescents just wasn't going to be feasible. So we end up with just parents. Next is help me decide, which is a couple of the decision making activities, which in the decision aid world are referred to as values clarification exercises. Um, so moving on. So this is a prototype. This is the original prototype of the home page. And you can see there's a couple of screenshots here and these four quadrants. Uh, the first one is a severity scale, as they had mentioned, developed the, the severity of hypospadias. We initially included both illustrations and photographs with the intent of testing those with providers to see what would be preferable and ideally maybe with parents. Um, we just decided to demonstrate the surgery step by step again with some illustrations and photographs testing to see what would be preferable. Um, down here in the lower left corner is an example of the home page, which we included a you know, large photograph as well as a menu at the top to help with navigation. And then on the lower right hand corner is um, a values clarification exercise, which is initially some open ended questions. We ended up revising that later. So we decided to do some uh, rapid uh, user testing essentially at a pediatric conference. Um, and this was done last year in order to get some feedback from providers prior to um, alpha testing it with parents. So we set up a booth at a um, essentially a pediatric CME conference uh, down in, in downtown Indianapolis. With, that was attended by about 250 people. And we actually were able to recruit 49 people um, to look at our decision aid. And we did some semi-structured um, interviews um, and using what's called a think aloud technique. And what's basically where you have them look at the website and tell you what they're thinking as they're looking at it. We also did a, some very basic questions regarding acceptability and usability. Um, so in general, 96% thought that the design of the decision aid matched its purpose. I mentioned that we showed them both surgical illustrations and photographs. About 59% of them preferred the surgical illustrations. They thought they were concerned that the parents may not like the photographs, might be you know, just kind of scared by them or just not really prefer them. Um, they did have a number of suggested improvements of this prototype, um, particularly regarding um, usability and accessibility issues. Um, they wanted to see broader coverage of content. They wanted to see it more parent-centered with a little bit more parent-friendly language. And then they had some suggestions about how to implement it in clinical practice, particularly in the clinic. Um, so generally speaking, they thought it was acceptable, um, but they had some critical areas for improvement, particularly with site navigation and visual layout. In general, they wanted to see less text, more pictures, simpler language, slightly broader content coverage, and they wanted to make sure that it was really at an eighth grade or below reading level. So these are some examples of what we uh, revised based on their feedback. Uh, so this is the hemisphere severity scale, which I mentioned. We were kind of testing surgical illustrations versus photographs. Clearly there was a uh, preference for illustrations. You can see the after picture on the right hand side. We made them uh, a little bit more cartoon like. We had added the flesh color. And then ultimately at a later date, we ended up adding some more uh, specific um, ar arrows to point to where the meatus is located. Again, this is a surgery storyboard where we kind of took them from step, you know, start to finish of how the surgery is done. 
we deleted the photographs and decided to do more of these cartoon-like illustrations. Also, you'll notice there was a needle in the initial picture. We got rid of the needle based on their feedback. They thought the parents would not want to see that. Um, this is an example of what we did with the values clarification exercise. Um, initially, we had some kind of open-ended questions exploring the parents' you know, preferences and values related to this condition. Um, Ultimately, the pediatricians recommended that we just do more of like a Likert scale. Um, you have a little bit more directed questioning about that. Um, this is an example of some of the um, data visualization uh, that we've created. So initially, we had this kind of simple um, graphic over here on the left, um, just talking about the prevalence. Um, but, you know, looking at some of the decision aid literature, there's been a lot of work actually from Elwin's group at Dartmouth, which is, they've done some amazing work on looking at icon arrays and patient preference and knowledge and all that. And this seems to be, at least some, based on some of their prior work, these icon arrays are a very popular way of um, communicating uh, data about statistics to patients. So essentially you have in the orange here as your numerator and obviously the denominator is all of the boxes there. So this is an example of the Hypospadias Basics page, where again, we have these kind of flush colored cartoon-like illustrations. We have some pronunciation guides. We also try to keep this, the language very simple. Um, this is an example of the surgery storyboard, again, based on feedback from the providers. Uh, kept it very simple, just the four steps here, all cartoon-like illustrations and no needles present. Um, again, this is an example of more of the icon arrays where we talk about long-term complications. And we try to illustrate here on this slide the difference between a mild case of hypospadias and a more severe case, with a more severe case having a much higher risk of complications. This is an example of a short form of the decisional conflict scale. This is used more commonly in clinical practice. This is the SURE scale, uh, which was initially included in the decision aid. And then this is an example of, again, the values clarification that was revised based on feedback. And the, some of the values and preferences we, we asked them about included how important is it to have a circumcision? How important is it for him to have a normal looking pee hole? How important is it for him to be able to urinate in a standing position without spraying? How important is it for, you to, for him to be able to have a straight penis for sexual activity in the future? So in this next uh, phase of the study, we asked parents what they think about the Hypospadias homepage. So this is the alpha testing phase that I mentioned before. Um, so essentially, we're looking at both acceptability and usability. So acceptability is, do they find it acceptable? Is it long enough? Is it clear enough? Is it balanced enough? These are all kind of the, the questions that we ask them. And there's an acceptability scale that we use for this. Um, usability is more, has to do with site navigation issues. Is the information organized on the website in a way that makes sense to them? Can they find the information they need? Are they able to navigate easily from point A to point B? Um, and I partnered with an expert in human computer interaction for some of the usability testing. So this was actually just done uh, during the pandemic, actually, conveniently. Um, we did some semi-structured phone interviews with parents in March and April of this year, again, using the Think Aloud technique. We also used a valid uh, tool called the System Usability Scale, which is from the uh, field of human computer interaction. Um, it's somewhat generic. It's basically meant to evaluate websites generally, not necessarily decision aids. We also used the decision aid acceptability scale. And then we looked at use qualitative content analysis to identify some key areas for revision. So we used only 10 parents, which again is common. Um, small numbers, as I'm sure a lot of you are aware, are common in qualitative research, particularly in usability testing. Actually, five to 10 is pretty common as far as that's concerned. Um, so we had this time we engaged more fathers. We had six mothers, four fathers, um, predominantly Caucasian, um, a variety of different educational backgrounds. Um, interview length uh, on average was about 54 minutes. Um, so based on their feedback, um, we decided to make some, uh, some key uh, revisions, especially to the home page. We, number one, you can see here, we changed the menu structure in order to make the information a little bit more um, logical. So we divided the, particularly the surgery information into preparation for surgery, number, two, number one, number two is day of surgery, number three, uh, recovery. Um, as you can see here, we have these call outs for each section in which we give a little bit more information about what they will find in each section. And at the beginning here, we have a, a more, uh, more in-depth discussion about what is hypospadias and also we kind of frame the decision for them saying that it has a wide spectrum of severity, your doctor may recommend repair, but you don't necessarily have to fix it. So letting them know that there is a choice. This is some, an example of some revisions we made to the no surgery page, which I will say was quite challenging to develop because there's very little literature on the long-term outcomes of men who, who don't, did not have their hypospadias repaired. There's really only about four studies on this, and they have a heterogeneous 
um, outcomes. And so after much debate, we decided to take the best quality of those studies and really just summarize the results from that one study and then reference the other ones. Um, so you can see at the top there, this is kind of the before, the bottom is on the after. We created some additional information and we also annotated the images and put some labels on them. Um, on the right side, uh, again, we summarized one of these surveys really just with text, but ultimately decided to add some more graphic uh, ways of visualizing the data. And in this place, we chose to use bar graphs instead of icon arrays because we felt that the icon arrays would be kind of busy if we're having so many different outcomes that we're looking at on one page. So in this case, we, we showed the bar graphs looking at penile appearance issues, uh, awareness of penile abnormality, and also issues with the urine stream. Uh, this is an example of some uh, revisions we made to the values clarification exercise. We got very mixed feedback from the parents about the values clarification exercise. Um, essentially, they didn't really understand the point and they wanted to see more direction from it. So they were expecting to get a recommendation about what decision to make. And that really wasn't what we offered. It was just more we were, our goal was to have them think through their values and preferences and come to their own conclusions. But they were kind of expecting more of like a BuzzFeed quiz, like, okay, based on what you answered, you should choose X, your son should have surgery. So it really did not go over very well. So after much debate and discussion with some of my mentors and decision aid experts, we decided to do a really simple values clarification exercise, which is interestingly one of the most common types in the literature, which is a simple pro and con list. Um, and also we, had, we just in, included some questions as well in terms of, you know, some potential, potential long-term concerns and short-term concerns for them to think through. This is actually not interactive at all. It's much simpler than the original uh, form. So in conclusion, uh, parental decision-making about hypospadias is clearly a complex and multifaceted process. Our hypospadias homepage, we believe, is the first parent-centered evidence-based decision aid in pediatric urology. In future directions, we will do some enhanced usability testing with parents. We're actually waiting to hear about an RO3 grant that we submitted way back in February and should hopefully hear some good news about that soon. Um, we're going to be using a, basically a software plugin for parents to download so we can track their real-time usage statistics, figure out what, how much of the website they're actually viewing, what they're actually viewing and things like that. And then in the next phase, we're gonna be doing some pilot testing in the clinical setting. So if you're interested in learning more, which it sounds like a lot of you are, um, I can recommend some wonderful resources for you. Um, in terms of human-centered design, as I mentioned, we had included some human-centered designers in this process. There's a fantastic uh, online course for that from a nonprofit based out of Boston called IDEO.org. Uh, and they do a course called the Design Kit, uh, which you can actually do in small groups. Um, I highly recommend that. Um, there's also, as Dr. Prosser and I were mentioning, the uh, Society for Medical Decision Making annual meeting. Yay, a little plug for that. Fantastic. I had a great time with the short course last week, as I mentioned. Um, that actually, I think, just wrapped up, right, Dr. Prosser? I think it's, it's done, right? I think so. Um, actually, um, our short courses are available, um, the recorded version, through the middle of November. Oh. So you can still sign up. I'll post the link. Thanks. Right. Thanks for the awesome. plug. <laughs> hey, I did not know that. And thank you for telling me that. That's thanks for sharing. I actually did not know they were still posted. I cannot recommend that enough. I went to a fantastic short course, two of them last week, actually. Um, anyway, they do have uh, the point of my story is that they have courses on decision aids. Uh, they seem to have those pretty much every year. I think Ellen Lipstein um, and Victoria Schaefer is the one I went to. Victoria Schaefer, uh, she's a um, psychologist from University of Missouri, and she did a fantastic short course on uh, decision aid development, um, I think this year and previously. Um, so I definitely recommend that one. Um, there's also a wonderful group called the International Society for Shared Decision Making. They do a conference every other year, which it should be on next summer if it's happening, who knows. Um, but I would highly, highly recommend that conference as well for a place to connect with other shared decision making folks. This is kind of like the who's who of shared decision making, basically. And then finally, any if you have a, the ability, I'm sure you do, uh, to take some qualitative research courses locally. I'm sure you have some wonderful courses where you are. Uh, I want to acknowledge a huge number of people, which I cannot get into all of them, but essentially uh, my wonderful team of pediatric urologists here, uh, mentors, my primary mentor is Aaron Carroll. Uh, we have a similar group to what you guys have. Ours is called PACER. It's a pediatric and adolescent comparative effectiveness research group. 
Um, I have a number of multimedia collaborators. The video you saw was produced by Tiny Tower Media. Um, we also have those illustrations from visual media at IU School of Medicine. We have a number of urology research coordinators. We also have a patient engagement core uh, who's done a lot of the, the work with the focus groups I mentioned. They were the leaders of that. Our pediatric research network sounds like similar to what you have. Wonderful team of patient uh, research coordinators and assistants. And then our, um, we call it Churtle, which sounds like you have something similar, are basically our web development and design lab. Thank you so much for your attention. This is a picture of our group. Feel free to reach out. That's my email and you can also find me on Twitter. Thank you so much. Um, that was an excellent talk. No surprise there and um, excellent work that you're doing. So if there's um, any questions that people have, um, uh, you can go ahead and put it in the chat and I'll try to be paying attention. Um, in the meantime, the, so the rapid review that you got from um, pediatricians primarily, it sounds like. Yeah, primarily um, pediatricians. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. So how, can you explain it, like how you set that up and um, how long they had to spend and what you thought about the quality of feedback you got from it? Yeah, so this is, it was uh, interesting, I will say, a very educational experience. So I, we were looking to get, you know, rapid, as you said, rapid feedback on a prototype. You know, and this is not something where we wanted to spend a ton of time you know, getting the data. We want to just get the data and just move on and, you know, revise the prototype. So I thought that why not just go to the providers and a place where, a place and a time where they're available. And what could be better than a CME conference, right? Because otherwise, you know, they're so busy clinically, you'll, ha you'll never be able to chase them all down. So I figured, hey, that's going to be high yield. Sure enough, it was. Now, the challenge, of course, is they don't have a lot of time to talk to you and you have to make this as convenient as possible. So we literally set up a booth outside of the main conference of the lecture hall and offer them a $5 Starbucks gift card. Uh, if they would sit down and look at our website and in general interviews were about, I'm going to say 10, 15 minutes. I don't know how to remember the exact average in front of me. Um, one of the challenges though, and I will say you mentioned quality of data collection because of the background noise we were not able to record the interviews. So we had the RA with red cap in front of them. So we had like the RA was on a laptop, the participant had an iPad and the RA would just, you know, type quick notes about what they were telling us. Definitely a downside as far as data collection. I would love to have recorded them. I just, we could not think of a way to, to do that in a, you know, a crowded lobby basically. So, but I still thought it was very helpful. It's definitely a limitation of the study, but still I thought it was very helpful. I would definitely do that again. Yeah, smart to have thought of that beforehand because I'm not sure I would have thought about the, the noise. The noise issue, yeah, I just figured <laughs> why even bother recording? Like this is not gonna work. And there wasn't really like a private space where we could do it. Uh -huh. We were also kind of depending on foot traffic. So I didn't want to be too far away you know, from the conference, we did send out some advertisements in advance. So we tried to let people know via email. And then I had the conference organizer announce it, you know, up front at the beginning of the day too. But I think a lot of it was foot traffic and the lure of a Starbucks gift card. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Awesome. I always think that we should do more of that at our meetings and put out all the surveys that need to go out in a year because people would be actually answer them. Yeah. The I think, it's, I, like I said, we have a captive audience and people yeah. usually have some extra time at these meetings. So, yeah. well, at least pre-pandemic, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it looks like David Sandberg has a question. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank, thanks very much for your, your presentation. I have um, two, two questions, and, and uh, one has to do with um, the fact it's widely uh, known. We, there are Cochrane reviews that have been revised, updated, showing the uh, efficacy of decision aids in a lot of different areas, leading to higher quality decisions. Mm -hmm. there's, there's also very compelling evidence showing that after the study is completed, nobody uses those decision aids. Mm -hmm. And so how, how is your thinking, uh, you know, this integration into ongoing care, uh, mm -hmm. how, how are you contemplating making sure that these things, if they are shown to be uh, effective. Um, how will you track that? And the, the other question has to do with um, in, in your uh, communication with urologists, uh, some had commented on biases, right? So you, you have a family that uh, uses your decision aid prior to speaking with the surgeon. Mm -hmm. 
what are the safeguards or what steps can be taken that uh, the surgeon's bias doesn't totally undo uh, what, uh, what, the what they learned from the decision aid. We know that uh, decision making is complex. We know that it can hang on uh, relationships, hence uh, why we use testimonials. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, if you have a surgeon that smiles, is very personable, uh, you have anxiety about to do this. Um, all of the knowledge is canceled out by a toothy smile. How does one um, address that? Wow, that's a fantastic question. I don't think anyone's ever posed that to me before. Um, you know, I think that you can't really uh, prevent that necessarily. And I, I think one thing we've definitely learned is that the provider-patient relationship is critical in this whole process. Uh, and certainly decision aids aren't meant to replace that. I mean, I think all we can do is really empower patients with the knowledge um, and, and uh, having them understand that there actually is a choice, that they don't have to do surgery, I think is already a powerful statement that they may not actually understand without a decision aid, right? But I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the, the influence of surgeons can be significant. Uh, and I think it's all about how you, you know, speaking as a surgeon, it's all about how you counsel people, right? As far as, you know, gosh, this is something we could or could not fix, or I really think you ought to fix this can be a very powerful statement. So I don't know that we can necessarily prevent that level of influence, you know, nor, nor do I think that decision aids are really intended to do that necessarily. I think they're meant to be a supplement to the relationship, to empower patients, to give them knowledge, to address their values. But Ultimately, there are no substitute for the provider-patient relationship. But I think you're absolutely right that this very well could happen. And interestingly that you bring it up, um, I think some surgeons may have concerns about this type of decision support tool as well, because, you know, what if they, patients suddenly don't want to, they want to have less elective surgery, right? I mean, that could be a potential concern as well. Like, what if these are going to talk people out of surgery? So, I don't know. I think it's a great point. And then your other point was about implementation, basically, right? Like how to actually get people to continue to use this. I think that's a great question. Um, and I agree with you that I think it's very common that these decision aids sound great and you do a study and oh my gosh, look, it's amazing and people don't use it. Um, I think one way uh, to do that would be to partner with our you know, hospital website have it readily available on the website and basically have a concerted effort that whenever people come in with a referral to our practice, immediately just give them the decision aid link, send them to the website and say, here's a decision aid. I think we have to be very intentional about doing that. I think the other, the other thing I've thought about is um, once it kind of goes live is tracking uh, usage statistics. So giving people, you know, a specific, you know, personal login so we can see like how many people are logging in you know, on a daily or monthly basis. I would be interested to know that, like who's using it and for how long. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Other questions? So, I have a question. So thanks for a terrific talk. Um, I think this is you know, such an important area to really empower um, patients and families in this case with the information that they need. Um, I'm really interested in um, in uh, you know, the spectrum of patients, um, both parents and patients in general, in terms of how much they desire shared decision making, mm -hmm. and if that is part of the information um, in your tool, if the, you if that is part of if there's any information that kind of feeds back to the clinician coming from this decision tool. Like, is there a summary that a family can take with them um, to support the conversation? Um, and, and do you provide in the tool any kind of assessment of how much they desire shared decision making? Because we know some, some people really just want the physician to tell them what to do, and some really want to be very, very engaged. That's, yeah, great question. Uh, we don't have anything explicitly in there now, but I believe there are some tools, actually, there you know, are. Right, some validated tools that assess yeah. the, parent, the patient's desire for shared decision making. Certainly something we could consider incorporating to give the provider that feedback that says, okay, this patient is really interested in shared decision making or this one really isn't. We don't have anything specifically in there right now, though. Mm -hmm. um, and we, I think I mentioned in terms of some of the values clarification exercises that we had initially, 
it just didn't test very well. Like the, we had the sure scale, we had some other, you know, sort of questions about their values and preferences and parents just didn't really care for it. It was really interesting. So interesting. Well, really yeah, interesting. we can only consider, you know, one of those uh, validated scales just to assess how interested are they so they can have something to share with the provider. You know, one thing that, that I would add, it was one of your early slides, Catherine, where you talked about the um, uh, human rights perspective mm. on elective surgeries. And uh, so certainly in, in the mild form of hypospadias, I think there's a really broad consensus that there's little, if any, functional impact. Uh, and, and that the focus is on uh, cosmesis. And, you know, regarding decision-making preferences, I'm just wondering if you have on the one hand, um, uh, the human rights perspective saying bodily autonomy, you know, that children should not be exposed to surgeries that uh, are elective, maybe solely cosmetic, uh, um, and that should be deferred until they can decide. My, my concern is that if we have parents who say, doctor, what would you do if this is your child, which it's not their child, uh, I'm just wondering if decision aids have to sort of move, one of the goals is to move people from the pole of, I'll do whatever the doctor says, to more of the shared position where there's more of an interaction. Otherwise, I don't see any uh, challenge to the human rights perspective that uh, this was a thoughtful process. Could you comment on that? Uh, yeah, so it's interesting about like the ph philosophically, like what is the point of a decision aid? and. You know, I think a lot of folks would say that they're not really intended to influence behavior necessarily. Like, for example, like with colon cancer screening, like we're not trying to get more people to get screened, right? We're just trying to inform the patient. But I think that um, if I'm understanding your question or comment correctly, that, you know, basically there's obviously a lot of controversy in this area. And if we are empowering parents to make satisfactory decisions, then that should really not be a controversial thing. Is that what you're saying, essentially? No, no, I'm saying that, and I'm maybe reading more into Lisa's comment, that people on a, a decision-making preference scale will mm -hmm. say, I would like to follow the doctor's recommendation, mm -hmm. you know, whatever they say. And does that signal to us that that's acceptable in these kinds of surgeries? Or do we have to say, um, no, uh, mm -hmm. I will not give you a recommendation without you participating in this process, knowing the upside and the downside of this? Hmm, that's interesting. I, my, my personal feeling is I don't think that we should, you know, force this on people. Some people just clearly are not interested in shared decision making. They just aren't. And I don't think we should really force them into the process. You know what I mean? Like, I think and that's okay if people come to us and say, doc, what would you do? And I, you know, with some reluctance, I will tell them, you know, this is my recommendation. Yeah. Uh, it's not my favorite way of interacting with patients. I mean, I, I, I like to encourage shared decision making, but I think some people are just frankly, just not interested, you know? But I would add to that, I think too, it depends um, on you know, how, uh, how the, the measurement of, and I think this is what you're getting at, David, how you measure success. And so if you're trying to just, you know, if the goal is to reduce decisional regret, then um, the more consistent the process is with the patient slash family's desire for shared decision-making, you could potentially really reduce decisional regret. But I hear what you're saying as well. Like, does that really meet the test of, I'm um, having an informed decision-making process, which is separate from shared decision-making. Yeah, it can be informed, but not shared, right? Right, or it can be shared right. And informed, both. Yep. But um, yeah, I think it's interesting you bring up this point because you basically, I think, just hit on like the big controversy in the decision aid world, which one of my mentors had said is like, there's so much controversy, like what is the outcome that we're measuring? Yep. Because you could actually argue that 
you know, at the beginning, how we um, revise that homepage where we say, this is hypospadias. You have a decision to make. You don't have to fix this, but you can if you want to, especially in more mild conditions. That actually might create more decisional conflict. If suddenly you're telling people, people were told by the pediatrician, oh, well, you should see a urologist and have this fixed. And then we give them a decision aid that says, well, you can fix it or not fix it. Well, maybe they have more decisional conflict now because we've told them there's a choice. Uh, so that's very interesting. Right? That's interesting, right? So maybe that's not a great outcome. So really, I think patient knowledge would potentially be one outcome to look at, right? So that's a really interesting point. Decisional conflict, we interpret it as something negative. But in fact, uh, maybe we should be viewing it in light of what's happening. People should be conflicted, yeah. not, to, not to paralyze them. Because right. if we tell a very clean story, you know, this is a simple surgery, it'll all be taken care of, no conflict, but that doesn't uh, necessarily predict regret later on. Yeah, for sure. And, and, to, and to pull in evidence from, you know, completely different area of like decision-making research is that, um, that it, you know, if you're familiar with Peter Eubel's um, hot seat um, decision research, which is that um, if, you, if you actually pose um, more difficult decisions to individuals rather than simplifying them, that, um, that the evidence shows that their responses are more reliable. So that, you know, test, retest reliability. So they're actually thinking, you know, more in depth about, it implies that they're thinking more in depth about those responses and that they're more um, reliable over time. Um, which would lend itself, you know, to that um, to that line of thinking that you could, it, you know, if you could move people through this decisional conflict stage um, in which they do have a reduced quality of life and you know more stress and anxiety, but that would result in a better outcome measured in different ways. Yeah, I think I don't know the right answer necessarily, but I think that we have to look at diff various different outcomes, right? So looking at knowledge, decisional regret, decisional conflict, you know, all the above. So preparation for decision making, you know, yeah. do they feel, do they feel ready to make the decision after looking at yeah. the decision? Do do others have questions? You can put them in the chat. The three of us are talking, but I know there are other people here that might have to, um, too. interject real quick. Getting to this issue, I see a lot of these patients in clinic, and the um, parents, especially the dad, come in and they're like, "I just want it fixed." There's something wrong with the penis. It has to be fixed. It has to look normal. Yeah. Um, I like want them to think about it and really try to tell, mm -hmm. you know, explain that it's a major surgery. There's high risk relative to other surgeries we do of having complications and um, trying to get them to stop and think through everything um, involved is can sometimes be difficult um, just because it, it is a sensitive area. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, would, I'm, I totally agree with you, Courtney. Like, I feel like a lot, there's like this desire for perfection, you know, like they were told something is wrong with your baby and they just want it to be normal. You and that's your baby, there's something wrong with your baby's penis. That's yeah, so they, exactly. Yeah, yeah. A different level to a lot of, especially dads out there. Yeah, yeah, it's true. So I think there's, um, at the very least, I feel like, you know, we have to do an, a good informed consent process. I think ideally, yes, that does look more like shared decision-making too. Um, but I think, you know, kind of back to some of the barriers, some people just aren't really super interested. They've already, they're clearly telling you what they want, you know, so. Awesome. Any other comments? Any other questions? Those are great questions. Thank you for that. Well, we really, um, really appreciate your uh, taking the time to come and talk to us and an outstanding presentation. Um, no surprise there. So Thank we, you. We appreciate it. Yeah, it was my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. It's been really fun uh, being with you guys today. Great. Thank you so much. That was really excellent. Really, thank you. Great. Thank you. Everybody have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.